afternoon. All together, come on. Good afternoon. How do you say hello in Danish? Is it literally just hi? Hi? Okay. I didn't know. I didn't know if that was like they saw me and immediately recognized, okay, he's a foreigner. Hi. Or if that's actually like a, like a general Danish greeting as well. Is it? It's, it's, it's general. So, hi. Okay. Hi. All right. Well, good afternoon. My name is Michael Carducci, and I'm going to do no magic in this session. So, if you were hoping for magic this time, uh, it's not too late. You can go to it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I actually have. And it was funny, every single time I gave it, uh, you know, I'd come in and I'd start talking, and as soon as people realized, there was always one or two people, as soon as they realized that this wasn't about garbage collection, they'd be like, oh, shoot, he means memory, memory, and they'd, and they'd have to awkwardly shuffle off. But uh, no, the topic today is continuous delivery. Now, I'm going to come at this from a slightly different angle. I have a lot of content that I'm going to try to get through, so I'm going to go a little bit quickly. But before I do, just kind of give you an idea of the direction that I'm taking from this. Basically... One of the things I found is generally the technology, the tooling, that seems to be the easier part of the equation. The most challenging aspect of moving towards a, a all-encompassing continuous delivery strategy, moving, you know, going towards a continuous delivery transformation is really the culture changes and getting different people in the organization on board. So I'm going to be spending at least half of this talking about that aspect of it because that's really where I've seen so many some of these things falter is not getting the buy-in that, that allows you to focus and invest in the infrastructure they need to invest in to make this happen. But I'm going to try to cover a little bit of everything because the real goal of this talk is to literally take you from zero to continuous delivery. Uh, to give you just a little bit of my background, so I, I told you the other day that I quit my day job to do magic full time and now for whatever reason I spend more time writing code than I ever did as a corporate coder. That's just kind of how my life has gone. And the reason was when I started working for myself, when I started running my own business as a performer, I realized that running a business is difficult. There's a lot of things that I never had to worry about when I had a day job because, you know, other people took care of payments, other people took care of administration stuff. I just kind of showed up and wrote code and then I went home. And there was coffee in the break room and there was, you know, there was everything I needed. And now when I went into business myself, I realized that there's a whole lot of other moving parts that I never had to think about. So like any software developer, when I ran into a problem, my first instinct was to throw code at the problem. And I built this product called Mago Tech. And Mago Tech is a tool... Ooh, Mago Tech, is, uh, Mago Tech is a company, Mago Talent is a tool, uh, a, a booking system, a business tool for professional entertainers. I might take this off. Uh, it's a little staticky. I'm, I think we have like a loose connection or something like that. Let's see. I'm not sure here. Let me try that. Maybe it's not going to... Am I muted? Yep. Okay, great. Great. And it's also not making any noise this time. So I go with that. Yeah, Mago is a tool for professional entertainers to, to book their own shows, to manage their business. Because uh, if I was running into this, I figured a lot of other people were running into this. So I built a tool to help me manage my business. And in the process, I built a product for a number of other people. And having gone through this, I can tell you that if you've gone through a continuous delivery transformation, you will never, ever, ever want to go back to the way that it used to be. And that was also true for me. So when I started my business, I, I, I built from the ground up a, a, a delivery pipeline, a deployment pipeline that I could follow and put all my code through. And uh, this has been, overall, this has been a really great thing. It's reflected well in my business. It's built a lot of customer loyalty. And I get a lot of unsolicited praise from people who have been using the software. And I, I've seen a few different things pop up, but the thing that really stands out, the thing that has made me stand kind of head and shoulders above any of my competition is how quickly I can get features to market. Uh, one of the comments there, he says, on top of that, Michael gives some of the best customer service I've received from any business. He he said, the few times that I've mentioned, oh, I wish Mago did this, Michael implemented the changes with shocking speed, sometimes within in one hour. And it was only having that pipeline to be able to make changes and deploy them into production confidently that, that any of this is possible. 
And there's a lot of benefits around this, and we're going to dive into all of these. But the, the overview of the session today, what we're going to try to go through in the next 45 minutes, is starting from scratch, learn continuous delivery concepts. I'm going to talk about team and organizational changes that you need to make this happen. I'm going to go through some tooling options. I have preferred tooling, uh, but a lot of the concepts that I'm going to talk about apply no matter what tools you're using. I'm going to talk about some best practices. And then building a continuous delivery pipeline, that's kind of the, the end goal, putting this together. Now, the reality of this is it has to be an evolving thing. There's a couple key pieces to put in place to, to make this happen because you're not really going to, in most cases, be able to sit down and build a pipeline in one sprint or in a couple weeks or in one month. This is an evolutionary thing. It's something that's going to grow and evolve and continue to evolve with your organization, with your team, and with everything else. So by setting the right groundwork, by building the right structure for a continuous delivery pipeline, you have something where everybody has the shared ownership, everybody can contribute, and this pipeline and everything around it can continue to evolve. And so that's the strategy I'm going to advocate. This has worked very well for me, and I've seen this work very well for other organizations, that you can build this pipeline that will evolve with you. Now, the tooling that I'm going to focus on, uh, again, I have some biases in this, of course, are Gradle and Jenkins. These are tools that, that, that I use. I have uh, I have some preferences around this, and also I just find that uh, this type of evolutionary approach tends to work very well with Gradle, tends to work very well with Jenkins, and the reason for this really is that you have your build as code, you have your pipeline as code, and so, you know, I'm a big fan of moving away from these very gnarly, very arcane build files that uh, maybe only one person on your team understands and instead moving towards something that everybody can maintain, that everybody has some shared ownership with. And that's why I'm a big fan of, uh, since Jenkins files were introduced in Jenkins, uh, you know, basically being able to have all of that as code checked into source control and anybody can modify that, anybody can evolve it. And you no longer have this one person on your team who's kind of the build czar and that everything has to go through that person, that everybody has ownership, shared ownership, that, and that's a pretty powerful thing. Now, obviously, the examples I'm going to go through in this talk are going to be focused on Gradle and Jenkins, but you can apply the principles to your environment, whether you're using Maven, Team City, whatever you're using, the, all of the principles, all of the concepts are still the same. And the other thing that I just want to set some expectations in this is, you know, as I travel around, as I give this talk, I find so many people are in very, very different places in their continuous delivery trans transformation. Some people are at the very, very beginning, and I've been on teams that are at the very, very, very beginning. And so in this case, there might not be any automated tests in place at all. They might not have any automated builds at all. And some people are a little further down this journey. Some people are very far in this journey, but uh, I'm assuming that that we have uh, very little going on there, and it's just kind of a blank slate to build from. And so wherever you are, you can get benefit from this talk. This is kind of my, my goal, my agenda with this. And uh, yeah, some, I've, I've even had people sit in my sessions and they say, I, I ask why they came in, they say, I just want to know what continuous delivery is because people keep talking about it. And I find actually going, on different, going to different conferences, people come in and sit in microservice talks for the exact same reason. I don't know, I hear everybody talking about it. And then we have executives, of course, who are sitting in all the blockchain talks right now trying to figure out blockchain is how they can use that for whatever it is they're going to try to use it for. I think people will be a lot less excited about blockchain, by the way, if we called it what it is, the slowest distributed database in history. And also the most computationally expensive. But hey, that's fine. So here's our agenda. Starting from scratch, starting from first principles, what is continuous delivery? Continuous delivery is baked right into the core of the Agile Manifesto. In fact, right into the first principle, this idea of satisfying the customer through early and continuous delivery of valuable software. This is uh, where the name comes from. This is where all these, this notion of frequent releases getting something of value in front of the customer again and again and again. Uh, and that was the other big piece of it as well. This notion about getting, it's, it's really at the core, it's about getting working software out into the wild. And it's, it centers around that, working software. And so we're going we're gonna to expand on this a little bit because it's funny, developers have always had very different definitions of what working software is. You know, it works on my machine is about as far as I've ever gone, right? And that's, that's... Uh, you know, I, I, I heard somebody once come up with this, this, this idea that we should rename all of our environments. Like the dev environment or the QA environment, the testing environment, that's, that's, it works uh, uh, in theory. 
Instead of calling it QA, we call it theory. On my machine, it's on paper, and then production is practice. So instead of saying, well, it works on my machine, you could say, well, it works in theory, or it works on paper. And, and the, but, it, but it doesn't really matter until it works in practice. It's all about getting that working software out. And as I talk about some of these, some of these concepts, a lot of people be, feel, start to feel a little overwhelmed. Like, we can't build all of this. We can't really do this. This is not feasible. But the reality is, to quote Paul Reed, he says, every team can and should practice continuous delivery. So, so just to start from, again, first principles, what do I mean by continuous delivery? Basically, every little change can go from your development environment through some kind of pipeline and into your production environment. Now, I talk to people, and every now and again, they say, well, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. From development to production? We've been able to do this for years. We just SSH into the prod server and drop a jar file in there, and hey, we're good to go. Uh, that's, it, there's a little more to it than that. Really, the key is it's not just every file. Every release is deployed confidently. So there's a little more than just this in your pipeline. You have a commit phase which will trigger a build, it will run your unit test, and that's going to trigger your automated acceptance test. This is probably going to trigger some kind of UAT, and then you've got an artifact that is ready for release. And that's the other kind of key distinction, is there is a distinction and there is a common misconception between continuous delivery and continuous deployment. And I've run into business people, they're like, wait, every time you check something in, it goes to production? No, 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 no. We have something that we're confident is ready production. In most environments, deployment is a business decision. How frequently you deploy changes, that's a business decision. And so we leave that to, to up to them. At, at some point, you know, you might only want a certain amount of churn. You only, maybe only want to do releases every day or every week. Some places do releases every hour. And it depends on the scale of the team and the speed at which they're making changes. So to kind of clear this up, with continuous delivery, you have an artifact that can be deployed to production. With continuous de deployment, you have an artifact that does go into production. So uh, it goes without saying, of course, that continuous delivery, or continuous deployment rather, requires continuous delivery. And if we look at that, then this requires a great deal of automation. And this is really one of the first places that you're going to invest a lot of your time building a pipeline. Because you want to automate everything, build, deployment, test, deploying to staging, deploying to production, even provisioning new machines. All of these things should be automated. Now we still need people in the process. People add value in this process. We need people for UAT. We need people for exploratory testing. We need people for feedback. But automation is at its heart. We want to automate <coughs> as many things as possible. And to quote, to quote Neil Ford, he says, whenever humans do the things that, that computers could do instead, all the computers get together late at night and laugh at us. And I think manual regression testing is probably one of the best examples of this. So we need to automate everything, and that kind of drives right into some tooling options. Uh, this is the, one of the reasons I like Jenkins, because Jenkins fundamentally is an automation engine that supports a lot of automation patterns. For what I've been doing for the last couple of years, I've been using Jenkins Pipeline. Uh, so Jenkins Pipeline is a suite of plugins that supports implementing and integrating continuous delivery pipelines in Jenkins. So your pipeline is going to give you a, 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 an extensible set of tools for modeling, anything from a very simple to a very complex continuous delivery pipeline, and you can model it as code that is checked into your source control that anybody can edit and update, and your build runs off of that in your Jenkins file. So Jenkins gives you a pipeline DSL, and this is how you define your builds as code. So the, the key kind of aspects here, when, you're, when you're, your pipeline, your, your builds are code, builds as code, they're durable, they're possible, they're versatile, and they're extensible. So by code, like I said, I mean your pipelines are implemented in code and checked into source control. This gives everybody in the team shared ownership, the ability to edit, review, and iterate on the delivery pipeline. By durable, I mean that your pipeline can survive planned and unplanned crashes, outages, and restarts of the Jenkins ma master. Pausable is a really important thing, especially as you're making that transformation, because there will, be, there will inevitably be aspects of your build pipeline that have to be done manually, that you might have automated unit tests, you might have automated integration tests, but maybe you still have manual regression tests, and you have the ability to pause your pipeline while somebody does automated regression testing, and then you can continue that, so you can have your pipeline optionally stop and wait for some kind of human input or approval. And 
The versatility is pretty key because they support complex, real-world, continuous delivery requirements. You can fork join, you can oop, loop, you can perform work in parallel. And by, I, did I say, yeah, I said possible. And by extensible, you can actually customize, write your own extensions to the DSL, and there's a lot of options for integrating with other plugins as well. So you've got this tool that allows you to build a simple automation script as code, and then the actual tasks that you're going to automate, typically, you build in Gradle. And so, so Gradle is a build tool that allows you to expand, ex expose a number of tasks as part of your build process. And the kind of key thing in here is you've got a groovy DSL. I might, do you have audio going into that from this? Okay, so I'm not going to leave this on. It's just going to be a little, if I, if I leave that there and I don't move, hopefully it'll stop. I think there's like a loose connection somewhere. I apologize. Um, so, uh, well, the key thing with, with Gradle is, is that there's a number of building conventions that, that, that we can follow. It makes it a lot easier for other developers to follow. So you can override the conventions if you want to, but you've got a lot of things built into Gradle that makes, you know, out of the box, you've got support for multi-project build that supports all of your kind of conventional dependencies, easy to customize with plugins. Uh, the key kind of things about it as well is that it, it follows a declarative build language, so we can tell it what we want to happen and not necessarily how we want it to happen. And and so that makes it a lot easier for everybody on your team to maintain your build files because it's exp expressing intent, it's readable, it's understandable, and ultimately maintainable. So essentially going into Gradle, every, you know, so Gradle, every, every project has, every Gradle project has a build.gradle file. And this is going to contain your tasks, your plugins, dependencies, but mostly tasks. And the, uh, the, the, in here in the tasks, every task has uh, a life cycle, has properties. It's got actions and dependencies. Uh, in the life cycle, we've got a couple build phases. So there's um, uh, an initialization phase, a configuration phase, and an execution phase. So the initialization phase, we use that to configure uh, multi-project builds. In our configuration phase, we can execute code in the task that's not the actual action itself. In the execution phase, we actually execute the task actions. Um, now, now, you can model fairly complex dependencies with your tasks, and you can, you can build your, your build file to be fairly, uh, fairly dry, and so you can maybe have you set up code that, that sets up a lot of different things, and you can reuse that as you need it. Uh, so that's going to give your tasks various dependencies. So with your, um, with your, with, you can define your task dependencies in a Gradle build file as well, uh, with depends on, must run after, should run after, uh, finalized be, by... So if you've got two tasks that ex execute uh, and, and one must run after the other, uh, then you can use the must run after. The should run after is very similar, but, but the distinction is it's going to ignore circular dependencies. And, and we're going to dive a little deeper into tasks here in a little bit, but I want to spend a little bit of time. I wonder where the loose cable is because something is really... It's this right here. Okay. All right. Uh, the key thing, though, is the, the team and culture changes that also need to... to to happen in an organization. And like I was saying in kind of the introduction, my little preamble, those are typically the biggest challenges. Like, like building, writing a build file, creating unit tests. And creating unit tests, I find, can be pretty tedious, but that's something that everybody on your team can kind of tackle, everybody on your team can handle. Uh, that's, that's pretty straightforward. You know, finding the right test runner, finding the right testing framework, finding the right mocking framework. These are not the real challenges, in my experience. The real challenges are the team changes and the culture changes and some of the organization buy-in. So let's talk a little bit about that because one of the biggest culture changes is changing how we think about quality. For so long in software development, quality was you know, insured by a, a kind of an after-the-fact inspection by doing big QA rounds after a lot of development. And so the big change is building quality in in the first place. Edward Deming talked about this. He said, he said, we need to cease inspection dependence on inspection to achieve quality. We can eliminate the need for inspection on a mass basis by building quality into the product in the first place. And this is what we have to do. We have to build quality in because it's so much cheaper to fix defects if we find them in immediately, ideally before they're even checked in the version control. And we can do that by running our automated tests locally. Because I think we all know that by finding defects downstream through inspection, let's say if you've got some kind of man manual testing process, it's time consuming and it requires significant triage. And then we have to fix the defect and we have to recall what we were thinking when we introduced the problem days, weeks, or even months ago. And so what we want to do is we want to create these ever-evolving feedback loops to detect problems as early as possible. And that's the kind of essential and never-ending work that goes into, this is driving me crazy, by the way. Is it driving you crazy? 
Okay, it's not just me. Uh, do we have a different headset by any chance? Okay. I'm trying to figure out how to, like, I'm trying to figure out, like, if I don't move at all. All right. So, so it's essential it's never-ending work and continuous delivery. And this is where, this is where we need that, that shared ownership of the pipeline. So, and, and, the, and, and part of the culture change is, okay, if we find a defect in exploratory testing, we have to ask ourselves, not only do we fix it, but we have to ask ourselves, could we have caught this with an integration test or an acceptance test? And if acceptance test fails, we have to ask, could we have caught this with a unit test? Or, or uh, basically trying to figure out if we could, could have caught that problem further and further upstream. But uh, the, ultimately, we want fast, automated feedback about the production readiness of code. Now, I, I think overall, there, there's a lot of good tools. There's a lot of good uh, general knowledge around this. We're all pretty good at testing code changes. But there's another piece that we need to be able to test as well. And uh, just out of curiosity, how many, how many people in this room have written a code change that brought down a production environment at some point in their career? Okay. Yeah, most of us, just about all of us. Um, uh, you know, I want to point out, though, that's a lot of work to bring down a production environment with a code change. Uh, how, many people, how many of us have brought down production with a single configuration change? <laughs> that is really fast. That is something that you can do in almost no time flat. I'll just go to a server and I'll say, okay, let's uh, update the configuration for this reason, restart, Tomcat, and boom, everything's down. So that's the other thing that we really need is configuration management. So everything goes in the source control, not just your code. So your configuration, your environment, and there's so many great tools that kind of facilitate this now. And, you know, building portable environments, building testable environments, uh, using containers, using, using orchestration tools, everything like that. So there's a lot of great tools around this. But the key thing is, the culture change, the, the, the thinking change is that we have to test all changes with the same rigor that we test code changes. So the big lessons to kind of take away from this is that testing isn't something that happens after the fact anymore, and this is something we should be testing all the time. But the other one is QA is not necessarily require, re, re, responsible for quality. We want to work with QA to help build quality into the process in the first place. Developers need to work with operations to build stability into the process. And this is where we, we also have this requirement for collaboration. And I think you know, this is where we get to this whole DevOps notion. And I feel like it, it's become one of those overgrown, misguided notions that, that so many things have fallen into the vast bucket that is now called DevOps. And so I really want to strip this back down. You know, the whole key is it, it's about a shared responsibility. It's about removing the, this notion, well, that's an operations problem, that's a QA problem, that's your problem, that's this person's problem, that's that team's problem. That we all take this shared ownership that, uh, that nothing is somebody else's problem anymore. That developers are responsible for the quality and the stability of the software they build. And operation teams are responsible for helping developers build quality in. And everybody kind of works together to achieve these organizational level goals instead of, instead of optimizing for what's best for a team or for a department. And you, in a lot of organizations, there is a lot of investment to build infrastructure. And so they might create a DevOps team to, to build a lot of these, this deployment and build infrastructure. But if that, DevOps team doesn't disband after a period of time, whatever makes sense there, then honestly you're doing it wrong because it's all about bringing that collaboration in, not saying, well, that's now this is the build team and you're the development team, they're the QA team. It's, it's, it's about sharing that responsibility and, and everybody kind of collaborating to work towards those goals. Another requirement going into this, of course, is continuous integration. And one of the questions uh, that, that I like to ask, and these are not my questions, by the way, these are just Humble's questions, uh, just to kind of take temperature of a room. Do you perform continuous integration right now in your teams? Go ahead and raise your hands. And keep your hands up, keep your hands up. Because uh, these are not my questions, they're just Humble's questions. Uh, does everybody on your team kind of commit to your mainline master trunk at least once a day? If so, you can keep your hands up. Otherwise, uh, does your check-in kick off a full build, full build and see what your builds and tests? And if your build breaks, do you fix it within about 10 to 15 minutes? Uh, you, or, or, or as, much, as quickly as possible. You want to, it's, a, it's a priority to deal with that. Okay, wow. This is, uh, this is pretty good. So pretty much everybody who raised their hand kept their hands up the whole time. Normally, you can write your hands down. You can relax. 
Uh, normally what I, what I find is a lot of people are like, yeah, we do continuous deliver, uh, continuous integration, and then you're like, oh, well, no, no, we all have our feature branches, and, oh, and then all of a sudden the hands start going down, and it's usually about 20% that still have their hands up, so, so, so kudos to everybody here. But the key thing is, continuous integration isn't just running Jenkins on your feature branch, it's a full pull, test, commit, and run. And now obviously some of these things are not easy to do in practice all the time. You know, every now and again, I'll work on something and it just doesn't make sense for me to, to uh, commit to trunk every single day and I'll work in a feature branch. And I, that doesn't keep me up at night because I think, you know, one of the things that we do have to be mindful of is, is not necessarily doing the, the perfect dictionary definition of best practice. Sometimes best practice is what's right for the team. Now, obviously, that requires wisdom and experience and everything else, but but be practical, that's kind of a key thing. Uh, one of the things that's worth talking a little bit about is, is the business cases for continuous delivery. That's because going into a continuous delivery transformation, it requires a significant investment. It in, 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 in requires a great deal of time and effort to build all of the, in, put all the infrastructure in place. Th things are going to take longer than they usually do. Let me, what happens if I do this? I'm, let's try that. Hmm? Okay. Oh, is, oh, it's that? Okay. Do, should I get closer? All right. <laughs> I can try it. Um, what happens if I put this? I, well, I don't want to spend too much time on this because it would be, it'd be easy to get weeded and we have 23 minutes left. But um, so the, 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 the continuous delivery, the business case, the benefits, because you've got to make this case to the team, you've got to make this case to the business people that, all right, we're going to do this, this is going to require some investment, and they have to sign on for it, because ultimately they're paying for it. And the, the process that, that, that during this transformation process, things are going to take longer. And, and so if we just go and say, hey, this is a really good thing, trust me, by the way, all of our estimates are going to double for the next, you know, nine months, and uh, we're going to be spending half of our time doing this other stuff that has, that has no visible benefit to you today, they're going to say, are you serious? Get back to your developer cube. You know, that's a bad idea. So we need to talk about the benefits. We need to talk about how to communicate the benefits to the business people to get that buy-in. And one of the easiest ones is to recognize how painful releases are. Anybody actually love doing releases? Anybody like, yeah. All right. Well, you're probably like well on the, uh, uh, the continuous delivery path if you actually like them. Uh, this is an actual screenshot of my phone one release night a couple years ago. Somebody forgot to turn off all the monitors and the alarms, and I got all of the emails. I practice inbox zero, by the way, so 29,000 messages is pretty significant. I think right now I have like 40, 40 total messages in my inbox, which is bad for me, but, you know, I'm traveling. And uh, it w it's funny. I, I, I'm going to go on a really brief tangent here for a second. Does anybody, I don't know if this was a thing worldwide or if it was just kind of a weird American thing. Has anybody in this room ever heard of biorhythms? Okay, one, two, three, four, five. And I, I don't, I don't want to point this out, but it's, it's actually it's like it's, it's, a, it's a generational thing. So I'm looking around, all the young people are looking at me like biorhythms and all the, all the, the kind of more, I'm going to say seasoned developers are like, oh yeah, I remember that. This was a, a pseudoscience thing in the 70s and 80s. Uh, and basically the notion was all of our physical, emotional, intellectual uh, strength was cyclical, right? That, uh, and this makes sense. Like um, uh, just intuitively. It's like, yeah, you know, you have good days and you have bad days. You have days when you can get a lot of stuff done. You have days when you just, you can't even get started. And that was the theory, that there are these cycles, that your emotional, all, everybody's emotional cycle goes in cycles. You know, you have days where we're feeling good, where days where we're not, and that runs on a 28-day cycle. You have an intellectual, where days where we feel really sharp, and days when we feel really dumb, and that runs on a 30-day cycle. There's a 29-day cycle on our, on, our, on our physical. You know, some days we feel like we have a lot of energy, some that we don't. And the only really, my only real interaction with biorhythms is I wrote a basic program out of a book in the 1980s. And that I wrote a, a, a biorhythm pro program in basic. And you're smiling. You did one of these? Yeah, there's, it's a, f a few people have done this. This was like a pretty common program. And it would just plot pretty little lines like this in your, in, on, your, on your Apple II, your Commodore 64, or, or whatever you had back in those days. And I never really thought anything of it. I just ran the program, typed my birthday, saw a bunch of pretty lines. I'm like, oh, that's nice. And I never thought about it again until I had a boss. My old boss, every now and again, I'd, I'd be having an off day. And I'd say, I'd say, Greg, I'm just having an off day. And he'd look at me and say, yeah, probably your biorhythms are off again. 
And I was like, biorhythms? What the heck are those? And it was funny. I googled this, and I, and I found it. It says, type in your date of birth. I typed my date of birth, and everything would plot up. And, you know, I was beside myself. Every time I looked at this, everything seemed dead on lined up with, with where I went. Everything was bottoming out. Everything was topping out. And it wasn't until a couple months that I noticed that these biorhythms run on 29, 28, 29, 30-day cycles. We did monthly releases. So when you start kind of plotting everything together, my physical starts taking a toll when we're doing all those late nights trying to get everything over the finish line. My intellectual takes a boost because I start drinking the Red Bull again. And then my emotional bottoms out when we missed a deadline. Then I got that unwarranted optimism. And then I'm taking the 2 a.m. production support phone calls. It's a pretty brutal cycle, and this is what I would do. And so the first benefit, the important benefit, is continuous delivery actually lowers your release risk. Because every time we did a release, it was a big, painful process. But when you're working with continuous delivery, you're working in much, much smaller batches. So instead of having these massive deployments that have weeks or months of, of work being rolled together and deploying it, we have very, very small changes. We try to get every single little change into, into version control and as far towards release as possible, and we get comprehensive feedback all the way through. So we actually get a lot, we, we end up with a lot lower risk profile, and when something goes wrong, it's easier to find the problem. We can do a diff. We, 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 we can look at it and say, oh, there's this one change, there it is, and, and we get that feedback right away, typically minutes or sometimes hours after we made that specific change. So when you're working in small batches, you get all these benefits. You reduce the time it takes to get feedback on our work. It makes it easier to triage or remediate problems, increases efficiency, increases motivation. It helps us uh, prevent us from succumbing to the whole sunk cost fallacy. And I joined about release pain. And there's this, there's this saying in continuous delivery and in, in, in some of these lean methodologies and everything, basically, if something hurts, you should do it more often. Now, I'm not a runner. But I, and I'm also not a morning person. This was taken at UberConf a couple of years ago in Denver. And uh, I remember one night we were in the bar, and I was, it, was, it was quite late, and I was drinking whatever everybody was drinking that night, and one of the, one of the attendees said, Hey, Mike, I'm going for a run tomorrow, 6 a.m. Are you, are you coming? And I've had a little bit of beer, and, I, and so I had a little more bravado, and I said, Yeah, I think so, yeah, sign me up. And he says, Okay. And then he, uh, he says, I'm going to head to bed right behind you. One more round. And I don't know, several hours passed and finally went back to my hotel room. And the next day, 6 a.m. Mike, come on, buddy, we're running. And he would not go away. I thought if I just waited, he, he'd think I wasn't there or something like that. He, he kept at it. And finally, I said, well, I don't have any shoes. He's like, oh. It's a Weston. They rent them. I think you're a size 10. I'm like, yeah. And they gave me running shoes, and we went out and did this. And uh, because he's a good friend, he took that picture of me. <laughs> and by the end of that run, and I'm a firm believer, by the way. I'm not a morning person. I'm a firm believer there should not be two 6 o'clocks in a day. And uh, that day there was, and I wasn't happy with that. Uh, but the thing was, after that run, I couldn't walk up a set of stairs. I, I, couldn't, I couldn't move and, uh, for days. And the funny thing is, you know, there, there's an analogy there that if, that if I ran every month or every couple of months, then I'm going to have all of that pain every single time. But the people who run every single day, any runners in the room? Okay, right? You run every day, more or less, right? And you could climb those stairs, no problem. If I went for a jog right now, I wouldn't be able to climb these. If I, yesterday, I wouldn't be able to climb those stairs today. My legs would just be completely shot. But it's the thing, if, 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 if something hurts, do it more often. And it sounds scary, it sounds counterintuitive, but integration goes away as a problem. And uh, you basically, you, it is possible to increase both stability and throughput. Now, one of the things that, that you have to get over in terms of, of a culture change is I've worked with, again, more veteran developers, more seasoned developers who remember when shipping software literally meant shipping it. And I've, I've been there. And it's, you know, and, and I've had those conversations. Well, in my day, developers were real developers. We had to get it right the first time because when we sent something off to master, you know, to get to, to, to print the disks, that was it. There was no going back. We had to get it right. Now you kids today with your continuous blah, blah, you could press a button, deploy new code to production. In my day, we had to get it right the first time. 
And what that really is, like I've had that pushback, and what that really is, is these are two different quality optimizations. So if you read, the, if, if you read Jez Humble's book on continuous uh, delivery, he talks about this. These are two different quality optimizations. One is mean time between failure, and one is mean time to restore service. And what you want to be doing today is to optimize for mean time to restore service. Uh, his example, he says, well, look, if you're building space hardware, right? You're building hardware, you're sending out in the space, and it's not coming back. It's really, really expensive to fix the problem. And if you're building embedded medical devices, right? You put something in somebody's body, you sew them back up, it's really difficult to do a patch if you need to do a patch. In those situations, you want to optimize for mean time to restore service. Uh, meantime, between failure, you want something to last a long time. But most of us aren't building space hardware or med embedded medical devices, probably. And his example are these two vehicles. You know, you get a BMW, that's an, you pay a lot of money, and that's an optimization for mean time between failure because your BMW is well engineered, it hardly ever goes wrong. When it goes wrong, it's really expensive to fix it, but that's okay because it hardly ever goes wrong. Whereas you get a Jeep, this is, you know, this is a vehicle that might break down frequently, but it's very, very easy to fix it. You can fix it very quickly. You can get to just about any component of it very quickly. So we want to be optimizing for mean time to restore service. Another benefit is when is it done? You know, because there seems to be a big gulf, a big, a big uh, discre uh, discrepancy between what we think is done and what other people think is done. You know, we have done, and then there's done, done, right? And I talked about this, you know, done, 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 done. It, my, my old company was uh, five duns. That was production. And that was why when I got that check, when I signed that check, I had to specify that it would be done, but it wasn't going to be done, done. I said it'd be ready for regression testings. But when you're, when you're going through, when your code goes through the, the point, delivery pipeline, when it goes through that pipeline, passes all your tests, you know it's done. And it's done for you, it's done for everybody. Uh, another big important one is, another big business case, is that we learn by deployment by putting code out in front of people. That's the best way to learn. You know, we, we think we know, and then we build something, and invariably the customers come back and say, oh, that's not what I wanted, even if it's exactly what they asked for. The very act of delivering software changes the requirements. So if we want to get the real requirements, we want to get the right thing deployed right away, getting things out in front of people very, very quickly is the most efficient way to do this. And we don't tend to do this, and that creates a lot of waste. Jim Highsmith from so ThoughtWorks released this statistic. He said far more than 50% of functionality in software is rarely or never used. These aren't just marginally valued features. These are no value features. The biggest source of waste in product development is the stuff that nobody ever uses. And um, what I did, instead of trying to ask people what they wanted from my software, I did deployments all the time. I, I, would, I would follow this, uh, this lean startup methodology popularized by Eric Riesch. And the idea, very simply, is you start with a hypothesis. I think people want this feature. And then you build a minimum viable product. So the, the, the very smallest amount of functionality that you can deploy and satisfy that requirement, the smallest, smallest thing, I put that in front of people, and I get feedback from that. And then I repeat this process. So somebody says, uh, I want this type of feature. Okay, like this, and I create the smallest thing, and I'll deploy that very, very, very quickly. And this was what was garnering that, that great feedback from, from one of my customers. And then basically, as soon as people have that, they give, they give us our, their feedback, and, and I, can, I can evolve, I can iterate on that very, very quickly. So ultimately, you want to learn faster, measure faster, code fa faster. So we ultimately optimized our process for time around this loop. And if you're following this lean startup process, then that's, that's your lead time, and you want to optimize for your lead time. And it doesn't matter if you're a startup or not. I was a startup, but this process works if you're, if you're building any kind of new capabilities, any kind of new product, any kind of new module, in e even in a mature pro product. This is a very valuable way to kind of go through this and figure out what you're really trying to build. That's one of the hardest things for any organization to nail down. So in a perfect world, we would have all this, but the problem is it's not easy. And given all of the business benefits, it, it, it seems sometimes that continuous delivery might, it might be magical, but it's not. It's just a shift in thinking about how we design, develop, and deliver software. And then we follow that with a focused investment on the initiatives required to implement it. And so where a lot of organizations fail, it, it, it's, it's that first step. It's, it's defi defining and committing to that investment. And, and getting everybody on board, explaining, demonstrating, showing how valuable that investment is going to be. 
Uh, because continuous delivery requires a large overhaul in your technical process, your operational culture, and, and, and overall organizational thinking, it can feel like it's an almost insurmountable barrier to getting all that in place. It does. It requires a hefty amount of change and build out into areas of your software delivery infrastructure that, that may have been neglected or may not even exist. That's the bad news, but the good, th good news is that we as, as human beings are exceedingly malleable, adaptable, especially when we're incentivized by the prospect of getting away from a build and deployment process that very closely resembles hell. And I've, I've been there and I've gotten out of there. But the other good news is, is if you transform any aspect of your software build and delivery infrastructure, you're going to get huge benefits. This is not an all or nothing game. If you just get automated builds in place, that's a great win. If you just get some automated tests in place, that's a great win. Any step of that direction is going to have huge value. So any transformation you get doesn't have to be all or nothing, but you want to keep moving in that direction. So the biggest initial investment is agreeing, getting everybody on board and agreeing that this is a worthy business goal. And so that requires the participation of, of everybody, the business stakeholders, the development team, uh, the op operations teams, QA teams, getting everybody on this. It's kind of requires some trade-offs during that build-out period, but, but ultimately it's going to be valuable. And so that's why it, it's important to be able to articulate a business case for continuous delivery. It's why I spent a little bit of time talking about this, because you've got to get the business stakeholders and the project managers and all these people on board. And one of the most effective ways I found to do this is to show them how much faster they'll be able to speed new features to market once the investment in continuous delivery starts to bear fruit. And um, just, I would say, imagine this. Imagine shifting the bottleneck away from the development, and now the slowest part of the development process is ideas. And so, so everybody has to buy into the long-term benefits. And, th and then the real discipline is keeping it top of mind, making sure, m keeping progress being made forward, even if it's only small amounts of progress, um, just making sure that the initiative doesn't stagnate. Uh, there's other areas that are going to need investment as well, but but again, these all of these changes are going to bring you a lot of benefits. So just to kind of wrap it up, I think we've got eight minutes left. I'm going to talk a little bit about building a pipeline and building a pipeline that you can, you can grow and evolve uh, and get some of these pieces into place. And so usually I jump back and forth between Gradle and Jenkins and uh, throughout this talk, but I'm, I'm leaving all the technical stuff to the end just to kind of make sure we've got enough time to get everything we need. Uh, the, the key thing about it is getting all the tests in place to feel that you have a, an artifact that is ready for release. The idea, the, the general thinking is that every build is a release candidate. So we want to get feedback right away. So when we commit, this is going to trigger our, our build and unit test. And if we get a failure, we want that feedback. We want to get that feedback and act on that problem right away so that we are able to remediate the problem and, and have our code ideally pass through all the stages of our pipeline and we have something that's ready for release. And the simple test is, are you 100% confident in that, art in that artifact? And if not, then you ultimately have to add some quality gates in your pipeline. So let's actually just kind of break from here and take a, take a minute and look at actually what it looks like to create a, a simple pipeline. So if we jump over here, I've got a really simple uh, groovy application and we're going to do we're going to create some tests now now the the first thing that we really do here uh is if you followed the conventions to get your uh, to get your uh, your, your Gradle setup, it's really effectively a one-liner. You apply the Groovy plugin, you apply the Java plugin, you apply uh, the plugin for whatever language you're using. And if you follow the conventions, then Gradle's going to give you just about everything else out of the box. If you're, you, you've, got, uh, you've got source main, source test, and if you get your test defined in there, Gradle is already going to give you a build task. Gradle's already going to give you a, um, uh, it's gonna give you a, a, a test task. So if we jump into Jenkins, and I'm, I, I'm going to create a new, uh, I'm going to create a new pipeline here. I'm going to call this, uh, I'm going to call this my great pipeline. And I'm going to use the, uh, the, the, the pipeline project template here. And we can give this just a couple of things. Uh, so I'm going to say this is a GitHub project. I'm going to get my project URL. And this is in my GitHub repo, by the way, github.com slash Carducci. 
And it is under, of course, there's no, uh, I think I have the URL here, it doesn't matter. Uh, continuous, well, whatever. I don't know what it is off the top of my head. I think it's continuous something or other. Uh, I'm going to say continuous delivery talk, I think is what it's called, if I remember correctly. And I can have it trigger to build anytime. Uh, whenever a change is pushed, I can, I can set up whatever build triggers I want in here. Uh, and then the key thing here is this pipeline script. Now, normally you want to have your pipeline script pulled from source control, and so you can give it a path. I can say, okay, it's in Git, and here's my, my URL to get the files or credentials, but I'm just going to write my uh, pipeline script in line for now. And I'm going to, just, just to find this in here, I'm going to say uh, node and... So a node, by the way, so a lot of the work that happens in a pipeline script is done in the context of one or more declared node steps. Uh, so when you confine work into a node, it does a couple things. It schedules the steps uh, that are contained in the block uh, to run by by adding everything in that node to the Jenkins queue. So as soon as an executor is free uh, on a node, the steps will run, and it also creates a workspace uh, where the work can be done, files can be checked out from source control. So the, in the hierarchy of, of, of activity in Jenkins, the, the, next, uh, the, the next piece is actually a stage. So we're going to define a stage, and a, and a stage is, is, is a conceptually distinct subset uh, of tasks for the entire pipeline. So, so in this case, we're going to add a, uh, a checkout stage. And uh, so this would just get our get URL equals HTTPS, GitHub, dot com, Carducci, uh, continuous delivery. I don't know why I'm worried too much about typos since I'm not actually connected. So this is going to, so I might have a checkout stage and then I can create another stage in here. Uh, I'll just call this build test and in here I can just call out to the Gradle wrapper. Gradle so the Gradle wrapper allows us to execute individual tasks, uh, in this case from the command line. So each one of these here, so in my stage I have, this right here is, is a step, and a step is just any single task. So it's, it's, a, uh, it's a step, fun fundamentally it's just a, it's, it's a, it's a command telling Jenkins what to do. So uh, in this case, the sh command basically just issues a, bash, a shell command. So I can say call out to the, the Gradle wrapper, and this is going to execute a shell script, so I can just say uh, Gradle W clean and build. And maybe I can add some, some, some uh, other properties in here if I want to archive my, my J unit results somewhere, so I could do something like add an additional step here that would um, something like dollar class J unit result archiver. And I can take my test result into build test dash dot xml and then put a little uh, square bracket in there and so I might have so I've got in this case I've got two stages and a couple of different steps so you'll notice I did I did clean build and I and I haven't defined these tasks if we look at my my uh, my, my build dot gradle file I haven't just defined any of these tasks anywhere uh, gradle actually gives us all of these tasks for free so And I actually thought I had some, some code where I, some slides where I talked more about this, but we've got a few minutes left, so I'm just kind of kind of run through this. Uh, the whole idea here in, in, our, in, in our quality gates is we want to get our, you know, basically you're trying harder and harder to break the build as it progresses through your pipeline. So you've got tests that run really fast, your, com your, com your compilation tasks, your compile, your unit tests. Uh, these run very fast, takes just a few minutes, so you run these on every check-in, and as part of the culture change, your priority is to fix a broken build. So you want to get these knocked out right away. And so to build that, so we just built basically this much of a pipeline in a few lines of code. Um, for a Java-based application, uh, the first step is pretty simple. You just apply the Java func uh, j the Java plugin to your build.gradle file. Uh, I have a, my little application is a groovy application. I just this the created the called the the 
the, applied the Groovy plugin, and that gives you automatically gives you the compilation task out of the box. It knows how to run tests. As long as you stick with the conventions, you basically have a one-liner. And then usually you want to add more to it, but that's it. That's the core of it. You've got this, this first tap, step. Now, beyond that, you might want to run some integration tests. And so these are typically longer running tests. Maybe they have some kind of, uh, some sort of setup process. You want to, you want to build everything, get everything set up. Um, so the, one of the ways you would do this is you would define source sets to organize a subset of your, of your, uh, of your code, of your test. So the, the Java plugin, the Groovy plugin, and, Jan and Gradle gives you this concept of a source set where you, it's just basically a group of source files that are compiled and executed together. So you've got source main, source test, those are, those are really two source sets. Uh, but but you might uh, you might have an integration source set. A, a source set always has an associated compile class path and a runtime path class path. So I do this to uh, group all the files into logical groups that, that describe their purpose. So if you look at my project structure, I have an integration test in there. Uh, the Groovy plugin, the Java plugin, they give you standard source sets called main and test. Uh, that, that you've got, uh, but the key thing is you can, you can stick these things in their own dedicated location and then set up your build to actually point to it. Um, so if we do this now, just, just jumping back into here, if I want to give, uh, create a source set very quickly, and I know we're just a couple minutes over, so I'm going to wrap this up. Uh, one of the simple ways that I would do this is just define a source set, source sets, and in here I would say integration test, and in there I would give it a a groovy, no, thank you, uh, groovy, sourcester, and a file of source, it's integration tests. And uh, I would give it a resources.sourcester, is file, uh, give it a file there, and uh, I need to give that a close paren, of course. So I, I'd give that a path to where it would go, and I would also define a configurations uh, test runtime. And I would give it a runtime class path. Put plus. And so in here, now, now that I've defined this and the, the plugin is aware of it, I can actually start defining my own tasks here. I can give it an, an, I can create an integration task, integration test. I can't type today. Integration test. And I can give it a description, a group, uh, and I point it to the test uh, classes directory. I give it a class path. And now that I've defined this task in Gradle, I can simply update my, my build dot, my uh, Jenkins file to actually point to that. And I can just add another step in here, another stage. And I can call this integration tests. And in here, again, because I'm just modeling the entire pipeline as a, uh, as a bunch of Gradle tasks, I can just, again, call out to the Gradle wrapper and call my int integration test that I've def uh, task that I've defined. Uh, maybe I want to run some static analysis. And so, one of th again, because you've got this uh, plugin ecosystem, I can just simply apply a plugin uh, like check style and or find bugs and because I've, I've got these these plugins in here then I can just add another stage in here uh, and in here I can just again call out to the Gradle wrapper uh, and this and this task check because again these plugins they give you uh, these tasks out of the box so you would go in of course and configure your your find bugs your check style whatever static analysis tools you want uh, but you've got those tasks there and so one of the key things is that I found is to um, basically model everything as much as possible as a um, uh, as a series of of Gradle tasks that you're executing through Jenkins and using the task dependencies, you, you, you can separate it, common, co common code, push things into their own, uh, their own files, their own environments. You can bring in plugins to handle all your integration tests for your static analysis. And, uh, and, and you, can, you have a lot of control over the entire, the entire process. Getting a package, packageable artifact, 
have you, you know, config, getting your build configuration, you can get all these different things in there, uh, manage different environments. But the, the key thing is, is build it in such a way that, that the team can iterate on it, that, that, that your pipeline can evolve, and build it in such a way that your pipeline can't regress. And that's where tools like static analysis, code coverage tools, things like that, that you maybe don't have the code coverage that you ideally want, but you want to at least maintain that minimal threshold and move forward, move forward, move forward. And I know we're out of time. It's flashing at me over there. Uh, so I'll be around. Uh, if you have any more questions, but with that, I will say thank you everybody very much for your patience with the static and everything. Thank you so much. Thank you.